Thank you. I'm glad some of the I'm glad some of the foremost uh, commentators on these things in our country in very different fora are here, both Professor Macharia and my good old friend Hassan. Uh, scramble for African resources. The length that was scaled to protect national dignity and preservation. The catchword is scramble. African natural resources, the dignity, and the protection of the dignity, and the preservation, I hope, of that dignity. The scramble for African resources started hundreds of years back, very many hundreds of years back. And uh, it was, in every sense, the resources, including the human resources. Not only the natural resources that we have in our continent, but even the individual human being called an African was a resource to the rest of the world, many, many stages, and still continues to be a resource. And what are the resources we are talking about right now, the natural resources, aside from the human resource? We're talking about minerals. We're talking about lands. We're talking about our forests, which are have been for the longest, uh, some of the best rainforests in the, in the globe, the timber, the rubber. You have to understand one of the very first things to be extracted from Africa is rubber in, Sierra, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. You're talking about the marine wealth, the fish wealth. We're talking about the ports because uh, for those of you who probably do have a very scanty knowledge of the history of this part of the world, uh, the Mogrisha port is called Banadir. Banadir comes from the Arab word or the Persian word Bandar. And Bandar is a port. So this was the land of the ports all the way from uh, Berbera Kilwa, Bagamoyo, all the way to Sofala, sorry, Beira, and the rest of them. So we, we, we have had those resources for the longest. We have had functioning resources of that nature for hundreds of years uh, since, of course, in, in, in the past. And then there's a paradox of the plenty. When you have a lot of things, you have a problem in how you manage them. And then there is the resource cast. When you have resources, the resources also have issues that they come with them. The exploitation, the rent-seeking elite, the corruption, the contestation between the different communities that uh, have access or those who do not have, have access to the, to, the, to, to, to the resources. So resource cuts refers to situations in which some countries have natural resources that generate a lot of income, but the income does not generate corresponding growth in the economy, but stagnation, destruction of the environment, and violent conflicts. I think the Niger, the Niger Delta, it's called the Niger Delta? The Delta in, in, in Nigeria, where Ken Sarawiwa came from, is one of those ones. Uh, to give you an example, Nigeria has been a major oil exporter since 1965. In less than 30 years, the Nigerian oil revenue has, has tripled or quadrupled or gone tenfold. It has increased tenfold, but its overall per capita income has stagnated. Poverty has more than tripled over the same period of year. Nigeria, in addition to that, also boasts the biggest number of millionaires in dollars in the continent of Africa. Both military and civilian governments over the period of time have taken their shares in looting the wealth and deposited the same wealth in foreign banks. Whereas we have this replicated in many countries in the, in the continent, 
there are a few cases that you can be proud of. Botswana, on the other hand, has turned its natural resources, mainly diamonds, into a blazing for the citizens. Botswana has the second highest per capita expenditure on education and has enjoyed the globe's highest, second highest growth rate since 1965. A nation of only one million people. Botswana DGP, GDP per capita is 10 times that of Nigeria. Of course, the other countries that have also had these uh, natural resources, and it has not turned out to be a curse for them. Uh, UAE is one country in, uh, I have in mind. They have uh, used it very well. So much so that it has become a superpower right now that threatens the whole continent and the whole world. Because UAE has turned its natural resources income into a powerful blessings. It's minimal, it's got a, one of the least debts in the world. Inflation is very low and an exception of social welfare. And benefits is on citizenry. Now, the failure of natural resource wealth to lead to the expected economic growth and development impacts has impacted negatively into the traditional historical modes of sustain or mainstay of economies in those different countries. For example, Africa, in its own humble way, was pretty much an agricultural uh, continent. Whether it is uh, livestock, as the Prime Minister was telling us, or it is uh, the subsistence agriculture, uh, we had those ones. But the moment you get these blessings, people abandon that. And this additional windfall itself is not used to develop other sectors of the economy, like industry, like uh, you know, powerful infrastructures in other areas, energy and the rest of it. So it, it creates the rent-seeking elites who are more preoccupied with the accumulation and consumption as opposed to putting energies into industrialization, production of service developments. This is where the problem is. Public expenditure, whenever you get these natural resources, the tendency is that the government's uh, budget increases and triples and keeps on going up. Uh, and clearly, to meet the, the gas or oil windfall, and then social tensions between the different contestors on that. That's why how you end up with coups and counter coups and ethnic problems and all those rivalries. The only thing is that when a country is resource rich and those resources by and large are plugged into the, into the what do you call the pipes of the traditional uh, uh, dominators of that, I'm talking about the, the West, you gave it a, a collective name, what did you call it? Unipolar, yes, that collective. They make sure that those tens, what do you call tensions do not, do not go out of hand. For example, you never see a, a very powerful tension in a country like Angola because they have that uh, oil there. Nigeria will have all sorts of tensions, but at the same time, the system will not collapse because the companies are there, Shell and Chevron and God knows all the rest of them are there. So, then there's, of course, this always uh, simmering uh, uh, things. In countries like Angola, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and Nigeria, oil revenues now account for over 50% of the ordinary government revenue. Over 50% of the ordinary government revenue. And when you look at the own countries still, that tells you that the traditional mainstays of the economy itself, other production areas, are losing at the expense. The more you get this windfall oil, which is free, the less you concentrate on other sectors of the economy. And, 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 and basically, that's what happens. Lately, to some extent, because of conditionalities, as they put it, they are, they are, they, they maybe they'll end up uh, uh, having more reserves in uh, Western capitals. They will end up uh, reducing on their own uh, uh, debt, what do you call the debt itself, total debt, and other things. But when you look at the serious efforts to invest that uh, and to make certain powerful changes domestically to create other sectors of the economy uh, to compensate for that, they don't do it. And uh, when the prices plummet, because you have this uh, bust, what do you call it? You, you have the, between the boom and the bust, 
uh, when the oil prices go up, the boom is there. When they go down, there's a bust there. So that bust again, the country suddenly becomes a very poor third world banana state. And you can see that in the streets of all those capitals. Uh, they face those consequences. And then there's always going to be some fiscal imprudence to try and compensate for that. And you have problems in that. Uh, and, and they cannot have any sustainable economic you know, investments in this so that they can wither those storms when the situation changes. You, you now contrast that with uh, Norway. That does not use its revenue from the oil at all. They depend on the other sectors of the economy. And this country has got reserves that are worth, what is it? 500 trillion? For a nation of only, is it 4 million or 5 million? No, no, it's about 4 or 5, yeah. 4. Yeah, yeah, around that, yes. So basically what they have decide, decided is that we're going to invest this. And by the way, the man who was able to manage that and has managed the windfall in the mineral sector of Norway was an Iraqi engineer. He came from a third world country. And, and, and basically, he's there. And I think he might be still alive. If he's alive, he's very old. So the, 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 the best policies that some countries, African countries, have been able to do to achieve uh, well, a little bit to, uh, you know. Now, the other thing that we have to look at is that our natural resources traditionally were taken by the former colonialists, by the former imperialists. But who are the ones who are taking now the, the resources, the mineral resources of the African uh, continent, or the scramble, who are doing it right now? China, India, South Korea, name another country. That's, that's where it's going right now. And, uh, and, and basically, as uh, Professor Wainaina has put it yesterday, when you, have, uh, when you have not prepared your leaders very well, and there always has to be a contract on some of these things, and they deal with institutional frameworks that essentially have been worked on very well, by very well educated, very well experienced, very well trained and prepared people, and you have only the president to give the nod and give an answer to that, Always those contracts are lopsided, so we end up losing it. Uh, the best, uh, the, the China, India, South Korea, to some extent Malaysia, have lately, lately emerged as major trading partners uh, of our continent. India's uh, imports from Africa are mainly minerals, just minerals, raw materials, no value addition. Minerals, they also include uh, occasionally some small things like uh, like uh, coffee or cotton in the case, of course, cotton is still a raw material. Even the coffee for information will most likely be taken to those places in the form of a bean, co co coffee beans, so that the processing is done, the value addition is done, the grinding, the roasting, and all that is done there. Uh, and, and you know, the major trading partners of those countries that are very rich in minerals, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Angola, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco account for 90% of the trade between uh, of the continent trade between uh, India and the African continent, over 90%. And, and you're talking about uh, close to 100 billion. It's 98 billion right now is, is the trade. So it's all in the form of raw materials that essentially, Morocco, I think, has been a little bit of an exception in this case, and South Africa, because they are, there's a company that is uh, doing the phosphates, am I right? There's a, a company in India that has been largely acquired up to 60% by Moroccan interests that uh, basically produces those, uh, or, 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 or uh, that uh, processes that phosphates and then sells it into the market. Uh, in South Africa, because of the traditional, uh, the Indian communities uh, hold on the Anglophone Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of business, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, South Africa, uh, Malawi, all those ones. There's always been a powerful Indian class that essentially is still doing that. They're still ending up with investments in, in your big, big families in South Africa that also have some serious investments in India. So in a way, and, and that is something called, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, transfer billing. Transfer billing. Transfer billing is when you have two companies in two places, both are owned by the same family. So to avoid taxes in one, you, you bill less, and, and, and you do it vice versa regarding on, depending on exactly how you want to, how you want to increase on your, 
So uh, India right now, 20% of India's uh, crude oil now comes from Africa. And I say, emphasize the word crude oil. Now the question that I ask myself is that why can't we process it and send it in the form of processed oil? <coughs> we can do that. Uh, and, and that is basically what it is. Not only crude oil, uh, uh, and that accounts for uh, from 0% in 2005, zero percent in terms of some of these things, because the Indian economy has more or less literally leaped and leapfrogged for the last 20 years. Uh, crude oil now is 60% of India's exports, uh, imports from there. Uh, uh, and gold is accounts for about 15%. Uh, phosphoric acid, uh, because of the, what I told you about the phosphates, is about 3.8. You have the, the LNG. The liquefied uh, gas, yeah, gas also, yes, also accounts for something. And then the most interesting part of it, shelled cashew nuts. Now you ask yourself, why do we have to export cashew nuts in a form of raw, not processed, shelled cashew nuts, which means they go and get processed in that, uh, in that area up there. And the same also goes when you go to uh, Indian exports into a, into Africa, I mean, to try and create some kind of a trade balance, because they say they insist on having that uh, trade balance uh, so that there's no deficit. Uh, what do they export in here? Healthcare owned by Indian farms. Uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, which of course they, they, they bring into the country. Their own textiles. So basically, you are making room for their own finished products. Their own industries have already processed them, and they come in here. Basically, take the money. Automobiles, Tata. Uh, service sector, the IT. Uh, you, you see what I mean? The IT. They are the best in IT here. And when they come to do the IT here, they create their own infrastructure here. Uh, Africa has made it so easy for foreigners to come from anywhere and um, set up a company in less than a day. And the next thing you know is that they are competing with your own, uh, you know, budding. Ordinarily, in any economy, there's always, particularly a growing economy, they have to have certain uh, positive discrimination for your own locals so that they can be developed and they can come up. And then immediately the Indian experts who are doing business with the U.S. and everyone will come in here and compete with you. So your, your own, uh, what do you call, technocrats and your own uh, 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 small uh, startup farms on that have no chance. Have no chance. So, uh, and then uh, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, so they build up roads, they build, put up what you call a power station. So they take the, the, the foreign exchange from here. So that way we, we are there. And uh, I'll, I'll just give you uh, one thing that happened in 2009. There was the India-Africa Hydrocarbons Conference. India-Africa Hydrocarbons Conference. And the things that the areas that were identified were five for cooperation between the African continent and India. Uh, and incidentally, uh, although uh, Milena says that let us have our own collective bargain and call ourselves Africa because they are also the other side, and I agree with her entirely. And most of these big, big economies also see individual African countries as being too small to deal with. So that's why they call 50 African heads of states to come and sit with them. And they have only one prime minister from India or maybe one... Um, um, uh, whatever, I don't know what you call the Chinese one. Is there a prime minister or a president? President. Yeah, and then the rest of it, or the US or UK, and 50 of them line up there for photo opportunities. But then, let me tell you, in, they identified five areas uh, to have to cooperation with Africa. Buying more crude oil from Africa, number one. Investing more in upstream opportunities. Upstream essentially means you know, the, uh, you know, upstream and downstream in the oil sector, investing more in the upstream. Upstream is the importation of that same finished product. You send your oil up there, they process it there, and then they'll help you also to, they take it in the form of a crude to sell it to you now at a very high price. That's the upstream. The downstream is, of course, the petrol stations and the rest of it here. So investing in upstream uh, opportunities, uh, exploring opportunities to source more liquefied natural gas. To do the prospecting, 
and also to go into contracts. You're the only, not only prospect, and you know, basically to get those uh, liquefied natural gas out of the sea, the sea, what you call shell, the shelf, or the, get it out. Of. But then, basically, that is another area they need so much of it because it's a growing economy, and they need these raw materials. Then making available, number three, making available, sorry, number four, making available, Indian skills, talent, and technology. That's what we take back. And that is not given to you to in the, in the form of, say, we are going to bring our own skilled, what you call technical class, to go and train your people in institutions of higher learning, in technical colleges, in polytechnics. No, they will come in basically as part of that investment process. They're coming in, basically you create those markets for them, uh, making available skills and talent and technology in a cost-effective way uh, for the benefit of Africans. And then saying supporting community development programs in Africa. When you see Kaloska, I'm sure you've seen Kaloska. You know Kaloska? Kaloska is a very uh, powerful multinational Indian company that uh, manufactures pumps, pumps up there. And basically, that is literally uh, selling it to all the irrigation schemes in the third world countries. But they're there to show you that the community, we're working with the community. It's got something called corporate social responsibility. So when they talk about communities, is that tokenism? You know that tokenism? Yeah? To ensure inclusive growth. Uh, and I, like I told you, the bilateral trade with India was 98 billion. Bigger than any trade they have with any other. Uh, not with the, with the, with the Europeans. Uh, and, and, and this is how it is. Now, when you look at the foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment, and there is a reciprocal process in here. The biggest foreign direct investment from Africa to India, you'd be surprised. So when I talk like that, you'll all get excited and say, oh my God, so we're investing in India. It's 64.17 uh, billion dollars. But that, sorry, it's 64 point something plus 137 and 112 billion dollars. Uh, well, no, it's uh, 64.17 and then 137 million and then 11, 112 million. But that 64 billion dollars is Mauritius, which is another African Indian island. They have the capacity because it's another Singapore, Mauritius is literally the richest when it comes to the African continent, per capita and growth and everything else. But they have that reciprocal because it's the same ethnic Indians. Indians are very territorial. They will only deal with fellow Indians. And then the only other ones who have done investments from Africa, FDI to, to India itself, is um, uh, what do you call the uh, 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 South Africa, which I told you because of the Indian hold also on the South African economy. And this is the same Indian, South African Indians. And the other one, of course, which is the only genuine one, uh, $137 is actually a million dollars is the one of Morocco. Morocco has got a, a functioning, a very powerful, and, and a very profitable uh, 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 phosphorus, what do you call, uh, industry in, in India. China, much bigger. It has emerged as the largest trading partner with Africa at a staggering $310 billion. US dollars in 2023, at an annual growth rate of 7.4, and it's still increasing. But the same thing happens. They take your raw materials, and they bring you their unfinished finished products, and the bulk of it is just your raw materials, which has not been processed locally here. And the China imports, China imports is metals, mineral products, crude oil, gas, and the rest of it. Uh, FDI for China in standards of the round is the biggest FDI, what you call a, a foreign direct investment in Africa, is China. And most of it goes into Chinese companies that come and set up shop in here. It's not to develop what you call the African economies with indigenous Africans because, like I, Professor said, these understandings and contracts and agreements are done between seasoned smart guys on the other side who come here for the interests of their, their people and politicians and basically people who have this country's knowledge and, and will settle for anything. Uh, Africa and Africans have been forced uh, into centuries of quasi inadequate integration with other regions. Africa's historical weakness makes it new, makes its newly independent states unable to negotiate 
neither its socioeconomic and political and environment affairs, nor its primary resources. We are unable to negotiate anything. Nor to set up industries in here, a uh, powerful, what do you call, uh, uh, cutting edge uh, uh, technology here, as, as a quid pro quo when they are, we're giving them, we are giving them our raw materials and everything else. But just basically, we are not able to negotiate that. Now, the only area where Africa has had an edge over everybody else is the ability for Africa to feed its own people through this subsistence agriculture. That has gone to hell right now. And what is going to happen is that African, Africa's agricultural land are up for grabs by more advanced, wealthier nations. The claims that Africa has vast tracts of idle agricultural land is another exploitative justification to acquire our lands and take them for a long term lease or buy them outright. So basically, the only thing our people could do was to engage in agriculture because that is an area that we, we don't need to have a lot of technology. Even that's been taken over. <coughs> As you are talking today, American farms, multinational corporations, have already leased on a long-term basis 4.33 million hectares of African land. Another raw material. Uh, UAE, 2.79 million hectares. Saudi Arabia, 1.307 million hectares. UK, 1.1 million. India, 838 million hectares. And in most cases, this land is taken away from indigenous people who do not have titles, who just get moved from one place, place to the other and shoved, and, and increasingly create what you call either uh, the urban, what you call the rural urban migration, because they cannot have any more land to tilt on. They go and become squatters in the, in the, in the, you know, in the slums in this place, in, 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 in major cities, or they keep on having smaller and smaller pieces of land. So, I hear always uh, rights, 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 rights. And Milena is looking at me. Yes, Milena, we have those rights. But let's uh, agree on one thing. We have needs and we have duties. We have needs. We need all this development ourselves, like any other human being needs. And we have a duty to perform and acquire those needs ourselves. The socialization we have had always with the so-called uh, West is that they put in their constitution and the pursuit of happiness. I have a problem right now. I was talking to uh, Ayub the other day when we go and uh, debate on matters in our constitution here. And everybody says that we're going to take the country to government to court because I have a right to housing. I have a right to these things. I have a right. Those are wishful thinkings. We have a duty. <laughs> we have a duty. <laughs> we have to achieve those things. They say in their place, the right, the pursuit of happiness. Your happiness is your economic, what do you call emancipation. It is your technological, educational, whatever emancipation, your military emancipation. Work for it, go towards it, and then you're going to be recognized. And, you know, respect. Respect itself is earned the hard way. Your enemies only respect you when they know that you are as strong as them or even stronger. So let's, let's move towards that. Uh, we, we, when they tell us, as Milena has said, and thank you very much, Milena, for that, they tell you privatize your, your, your public companies, government should get out of business, do all sorts of things. The idea is so that they can come and take over everything. They've taken over the resources, natural resources. They've taken over the lands now. They've taken over the corporations. So basically, the land, <coughs> One of the biggest impetus in inviting industries to come to you is that there are people who are skilled and people who are not very expensive in terms of wages. Now, when they take your lands and they achieve their food security plus their surpluses plus their businesses by tilling your own land and paying your boys and girls paltry sums to work on those lands. Those of us who are from Kenya understand that very well. We have the flower industry in here, one of the most lucrative areas. But the workers in there earn as low as $50, $60 per month, for a whole month. 
and put in a sluggish, you know, difficult 10 hours. But the bulk of that money, all that flour ends up in Amsterdam <laughs> and people are making millions and billions out of it. It's the same people who come from those sides and come and exploit you here. But the government, governments will never assist on these areas because of the primary original genesis of the formation of governments and states in here. When the colonialists left, they left their own seeds here. So the people, and I want to say this, and I don't want to, where, Abdi, 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 where is the, Abdi uh, we, we in, At least in Kenya, we, because we talk about these things in the past tense, they happened before. Uh, 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 the richest family in this country is the very first family of this country. The first prime minister who became the president and died in office. Uh, that's uh, the Kenyatta family. The second most uh, richest country family is the, the Moi family. The Moi family. Uh, the third richest country uh, family, they also say Kibaki is not a poor man. He's a very rich man, an extremely rich man. And the one who has taken over all that now, overtaken and literally has, 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 has defeated himself is Uhuru Kenyatta because he as Uhuru Kenyatta is richer than the Kenyatta family today. 10 years being the president of this country is richer than that. And that is the culture that was left everywhere. They had the people in Gabon and the only country that said no to it were two countries. Uh, uh, Eritrea came much later. But in the initial stages, the countries that said no to it was Secretaries Guinea. Yeah? That refused also that part. And they remember how much they have destroyed it throughout history until now. Now probably there's a little bit of. And the other one was Nyerere, Julius Nyerere, Tanzania. Today, Tanzania is the most egalitarian country in this part of the world. And there's more hope in Tanzania than any other country in the region here, save for Eritrea. Let me tell you about what you say, democracy. Hassan knows that you have not had a democracy for the longest. Hassan, did you have any democracy? You never had a democracy. Democracy in Africa is the Western way of keeping you in shackles because they determine who becomes the president. They determine, it's a sham. It's a hoax. It's fake. It's fake. We say in our country, it's not sufficient for you to win in elections, but you have to, you have to be the one who counts the votes. I have seen personally when I defeated somebody with 6,900 votes, and all he did is he just created another number and he was announced as the winner with 23,000 votes. It's never been there. Never been in the history of the whole Northern Kenya, not even 14,000. I had the maximum, which was about 14,000. The man had about 6,000 something. And he was announced as, um, I defeated with about 6,900 votes. And it was announced. And that's what happens. That's what happens in all. 60% of the members of parliament in my parliament are rigged in. Hassan, and that has been the case for, for forever, for the longest, for the longest, for all that I remember. So we shouldn't be saying democracy, human rights, nobody cares about human rights. The, 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 the. Really? Uh -huh, huh, huh. Yes. <laughs> This time, was, this time was a mistake, let me tell you. <laughs> this time was a serious mistake. Because they, they brought it in big bags, almost 200 million Kenyans, and tell him, take this and take a walk. And he said, uh, no. And not, not anybody else says no, by the way. Even Mohammed Fai, if he was there as a retiring officer, he would have taken the 200 million. Mohammed Fai saw? <laughs> And <laughs> so basically what we have, we don't have a democracy in here. 
And, and anywhere where you are told that there's a democracy, it's a farce and facade. For those of you in Somalia who think there's something called democracy that you have not experienced lately and that you should you really love it, you love it and you run towards it. The West has created two forms of democracy, one for itself and the other one for the lesser humans. For the lesser humans, it is to subjugate, to maintain what you call the exploitation of your mineral resources and your human resources and everything else. So, this is the situation we have. Now, I, 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 I will, I'm just about to finish. Uh, and you see, when they tell you to privatize, the British, British Telecom, is it private? British Railways? British Posts? British Airways? But they forced us to privatize everything ourselves. And they say, this is a conditionality. So basically, when, 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 when you take a conscious decision yourself, conscious decision yourself, and you have that widely integrated within the continent itself, in which you protect your own natural resources and make sure that anybody who wants to plug into these natural resources must be prepared to take it when a value is added to it. When a value, when it is processed, if it's a crude oil, why should Nigeria not be able to process its own crude oil 60 years later, 59 years? 1965 is when they exported the, the first. Is it difficult to have a refinery? A refinery is the easiest technology. And then we say, our what do you call our minerals? Everything must be value addition has got to be here, from here. We don't do it. So, so basically, we need to do that the same way countries like Korea and all, you know, Singapore and uh, Mahatma, Mahathir Mohammed uh, 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 Malaysia, all of them are done. By the way, I, I, I had an opportunity myself uh, to attend uh, uh, a prestigious postgraduate uh, institution for uh, one of the modules of my master's degree in business administration, which I did in some of those uh, small sojourns when I was thrown out of parliament and had nothing to do. So I ended up doing it. And I went to South Korea for, for that small module there. At the time of independence, South Korea had only two resources. One was seaweeds. And the other one was comfort women for Japanese. Don't say prostitution is called comfort women. But basically, Korean women who would go into Japan and be used in that human trafficking for their flesh and body, and they would send money back home. And I was there. The economy today, their PPP is 2.9 trillion. And the president of that country came to Kenya at independence and borrowed $800,000 from Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta. To travel around the world, got scholarships for 3,000 young boys and girls and sent them to top technical colleges. He was not asking for medicine. He was not asking for engineering, but other things. He just sent them for engineering. They are now the biggest shipbuilders in the world, some of the biggest. They produce the cars. And by the way, there are 38,000 American Marines and, 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 and Rangers there, you will never see a Korean girl with any of them. You get my point? What will he tell a girl who's earning $10,000 and is an American Marine earning, what, a couple of hundred dollars? And, and now contrast that with Philippines, which they come, they, they come with all. You never see. Have you ever seen Americans who work in Japan and the rest of them and bring home uh, uh, Japanese women? No, because they, they are, they're, they're higher class. So, so it's, it's, it's and, and that's what they are. From, from that poverty to uh, what do you call uh, 1.7 trillion nominal, nominal GDP. Our nominal GDP in Kenya is 115 billion. 115 billion. They are more than 10 times. No, no, the PPP is more. Uh, what do you call the uh, purchase uh, power parity? 
Even them, the purchase par parity for them is 2.9 trillion. But the nominal GDP is 1.7 trillion. So they are 10 times more powerful than us in economy and much smaller country, much smaller country. So, so basically for us to be able to, pro the marine resources, you go to the sea, Somali marine resources, let me for a moment uh, transgress into the Somali areas. The Ch Chinese come with uh, 30, 30 ships to come and scoop your fish and they pay the government $1 million. And by the way, that blue tuna, I don't know whether it's a blue tuna or yellow tuna. Blue tuna, I have seen one blue tuna, 600 kilograms, sold for $1.8 million. And these guys are taking thousands of tons from your sea. And all that your government asks for, a few million from them. So we, the, the, the onslaught and the scramble, when you say scramble, scramble, scramble means a rush. Am I right? Scram, you know, those of you who used to play, uh, uh, what do you play? You, does anybody play uh, rugby? Move fast with a force. Scramble for Africa is now more than ever. And not from the traditional exploitative uh, unipolar West. It is from everywhere. Everywhere, including a small, tiny country like UAE, has got ships and ships in the Somali, off the Somali coast and is scooping your natural resources in hundreds of millions every week. So this is, this is the, this is the sad situation. Now the, 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 the and, 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 and by the way, let me tell you. Let me tell you, if we don't do anything, all this will be contracted. Do you know why, where Guantanamo Bay is? Does anybody know where Guantanamo Bay is? It's in Cuba. Uh, does Cuba have a diplomatic relations with the US? Why does um, uh, the, the Americans have a base in, uh, in, on Cuban uh, territory? They, leased, they, they were given that exclusive lease in 1934. Cuba does not have the power, the military power to throw them out, and the lease is there. So if your presidents lease your land, lease your resources, lease all these things, you are looking at 200 years from now in that kind of a poverty, and there's no still light at the end of the tunnel. Because if they lease your offshore, what do you call, uh, blocks to American companies, and the Americans bring their own naval warships, how will you reclaim it? So those of you are in parliament, you better make a law now in Somalia. We tried it in Kenya. We have a problem. Nobody knows where is Amahashi. Nobody knows uh, the Talo, the Talo Turkana. Yeah. Does anybody know who owns that? Does anybody know in Kenya who owns the four blocks that there was a problem in Somalia? They are not in the name of the Republic of Kenya. Macharia, Professor, you know what I'm talking about. The country will only be having royalties out of it. It's in the names of individual powerful guys. And it's already been done, the negotiations with big oil companies like Eni and Total and the rest of them. And that contract probably is going to be there for the next 100 years. So what will the Kenyan people benefit from it, even now when we have to share both? Nothing. You'll just get a small royalty, a small royalty. So how do we save Africa from itself? The scramble for African resources is there. How do we protect it? I think uh, I saw a member of parliament from the Somali parliament, former minister Wizi. Are you still in parliament? Advata? I told your parliamentarians many years back, you must make a law that says that any treaty, any contract that is done by the executive outside this country cannot be valid, is voided unless it comes through parliament. That's why 
Some of you ask yourselves that certain agreements with some of the neighboring countries I'm not going to mention. Uh, some of those agreements. Does anybody know the full extent of it? So the Venezuelans and Colombians, but so the almost machinery is what they can get it on. Where do you want to know? Get up, I, I just want to make one uh, one statement of fact very clear. I am not a member of the board of Afro-Asia Institute for Strategic Studies. Myself, our Prime Minister, we supported it. We're helping them. Many others, Abdurrahman, all of us are basically supporters of like the rest of you. The board has Professor Abduhab and two other foreigners so far. So this is an institution as much as yours, as it is. Maybe you, you own it more than me, because I'm a politician, I'm an interested past. Yeah. You, you get my point? Those of us who are in politics, me and uh, 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 we, we're not going to use this. Even uh, at the <laughs> The other one is that lady up there. I don't know. She must be. Are you one of them? <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> so these are these are technocrats. These are intellectuals, powerful intellectuals, and it's going to draw from the whole region. All all the board are basically from the region, and these are people who are apolitical, but basically are going to give very powerful insights into the way we want this institution to impact. I am going to be a net consumer of the products of this. Institute. You know what I mean? When you come up with very powerful ideas, I'll implement them as a politician in my own right. So, uh, to try and change the narratives there. Yeah. And, and, uh, and of course, Ahmed Hashi, if you get, we give him a nomination. I, he told me last time he wanted to run in uh, Langata, and I gave him all my support that he chickened out the last minute.